I still progressed and I still did very well, but I know it could have been a lot better. Anytime I would visit Texas or come back home, train at my stomping grounds, all of a sudden I'm doing stuff that, you know, that's, that's, that's ludicrous. <laughs>
And then there's a time for like pulling training, which is more like a gentle, like guiding it forward and like kind of letting it come to you. And you got to balance the two things throughout the year. But a lot of powerlifters seem to really have gravitated more towards auto regulating their training a little bit more than like using linear periodization, which at least when I really was going through my most intense powerlifting phase, powerlifting phase, quote, not competitive. I don't know. At the time, like percentages, really the the sun, everything was revolving around at the time. Everyone was into linear periodization, at least in my circles at the time. So everyone kind of ran through that. But I, I've really found that most people really like the auto regulation. And when I see someone that's actually pulling the biggest numbers in the world, it's like nice to see because it's like, see, this actually works even at the high level. Like you don't necessarily have to have everything like at a certain number. You're not screwing up if you pull back a few pounds or go up a few pounds that week. One day, you know, every once in a while, if you're pulling back a few pounds, I mean, in the grand scheme of things, it's like for overall, like long-term progress it's probably like a lot of times the better thing to do in some of those situations rather than continue to kind of aggressively just stick with a pre-planned number and just kind of hit it regardless of how you feel i mean perhaps like there are times where you kind of need to do that but i would say if you're competing but but if you're not competing or if you do other sports endeavors i think a lot of times it's it's auto regulation is probably one of the the better the better strategies for sure a lot of top level lifters that i know all do do auto regulation some more extreme than others um you know you kind of see different systems and and a lot of them you know well with like top level i guess lifters or if you look at that kind of different subset of like genetics most things actually work but it's just i guess what gives you the most bang for your buck and what also keeps you the healthiest yeah that, that was the big thing for me the reason why it was difficult to accept at first is because i was so um just my personality at least me and, and other people that i work with sometimes reflect the same i would get anxious if i felt like for whatever reason i didn't beat a pr by five pounds or something that week or something like that I felt like if I didn't push it to the absolute max that I wasn't creating an adaptation. Mm -hmm. It took me a little while to like understand that wasn't true. I went through a phase eight years ago where I almost had never taken a deload, like a proper one. And I would just go through like long, hellish blocks of training where I was beating myself into the ground and not understanding why I was regressing or why I just felt like crap all the time. I always thought that it was like something I would push through. But uh, as soon as I started actually taking real deloads and also auto-regulating weights, again, like more of a pulling approach than a pushing one, at least for me, that's when PRs seem to come pretty easily. And so I applied that across the board with a lot more people. And I just found that taking a more organic approach to training tends to work well, unless you're in that, like you said, once you kind of enter more of a peaking phase, I think you really need to be a little smarter with what you're doing. The further away from competition you are, I find that the more organically you allow things to kind of come to you, the more you build up that big broad base that you can apply to whatever. Yeah, um, exactly. I mean, you know, my next meet is in September and a lot of the training I've done over the past few months has been a bit more reps than I would normally do with like the sort of main three lifts, which is really not a lot still, but but more than usual. And, and at the weights that I'm lifting, it, it kind of, I, I understand that it affects you differently. So you, you kind of have to, you you need to be not just meticulous, like with your planning, but also meticulous with, you know, just how, how you're feeling on the day. And when, you know, when you're in there, there are ideal numbers that I calculate and that I like to hit, but there have been, you know, days on certain lifts where I'll go a little bit lighter if necessary. I mean, the way that I kind of conceptualize it is, is I'm saving myself for the next week, which needs to be heavier, theoretically, if I'm over, you know. Yeah. Um. So, you know, give myself a better chance to to perform better next week by, um, you know, biting the bullet and going a little bit lighter today. I can't really, I guess, overstate the importance of that because if you don't really have that ability to do that, hopefully, hopefully you have a coach and then hopefully you have a coach that understands these principles. Um, if you don't have the ability to do that, you have to be really careful because you can get yourself into a, a nasty situation. You might structure your training a little bit differently depending on how far out you are from competition, of course. But mm -hmm. generally speaking, how do you like to split up your training qualities and your week? Because what I'll normally do for most people, and it's a different endeavor, but I'll, I'll normally have a pretty concurrent progression of things. We're always dosing a little bit of everything. But do you go through phases where you really focus a lot more on hypertrophy and not so much on the big three? Or are you pretty concurrently working on the big three year round? Because I know some people really like to cut back on the the big lifts for a little while and just focus on mass and then really peak before competition mm -hmm. but not everyone's like that yeah i work on i pretty much work on the big three year round actually i i find that i am able to like with those compound lifts gain mass you know if i if i do hypertrophy with those lifts but i also do a lot of you know accessory work and stuff too and i do more accessories certainly as i'm further out from a meet um like most days you know i'll have like you know six or seven other like accessory exercises and then usually Right now, just kind of for maintenance, two of the days, two or three of the days, I'll do cardio. Um, and I kind of rotate every few weeks between like cycling or rucking 
or um, running. But if I'm getting ready for like a PT test, then it's just like running. That usually works for me. I mean, I, I usually don't take out the big three. I usually leave them in. Um, they're pretty much a, a emphasis for me year round. The way that I train them is is a bit different. Like most days, minus perhaps maybe like the last week of like a training block where I want to go heavier intentionally. Most of those days, I'm not too like overly concerned with how heavy I'm going per se, but just as long as I'm progressing. And even if it's, you know, 10 or 15 pounds or 20 pounds, you know, each week, and then I take a bigger jump last week and push a bit harder to kind of see what, you know, strength looks like. I've, I found that that approach, that approach works very well for me as well. Yeah, no, I, I pretty much, I leave them in your round. And, you know, what I might do is other things like I might use less equipment. Like I might, you know, not use my belt as much, or I might not use my sleeves as much, or I might, I might also do more um, like variations of the big three. Um, or I might like, for instance, for squat, I might just focus solely on high bar or I might, um, you know, for bench press, I might just do strictly close grip bench press. And, you know, for deadlift, I might do strictly conventional for a while. So that's kind of how I'll also play with those variables and things sometimes too. I'm big on the variations, at least for me, uh, just because I wasn't powerlifting. But I was going to ask, do you use a lot of volume on the big three? Like you kind of alluded to, you lose a lot, you use a lot of volume further out from competition and you start using top sets closer to, or are you kind of using top sets throughout and you uh, you just lower the volume as you get closer to competition. Oh, I use top sets throughout at the moment, but um, I still do volume with the three lifts though. Yeah. Like a top set and then more volume. That's at a yeah. certain perhaps like percentage or, or threshold um, after that top set. Yeah. That's, that's basically what I do with most guys as well. Cause it gives us a lot of flexibility. I'll adjust the, the back offsets volume usually, but it's like a really easy way to just get some volume in without feeling like your peak strength is falling off. But in terms of like the way you fluctuate, do you have like blocks and phases where you emphasize something in particular or like how is it that you would go through like, let's say you're two months out from a meet. Are you really cutting accessory work down at that point and you're really driving up periodization, periodization, periodizing the training where it's like, OK, I'm aiming for this weight today. I'm going to work up to that as a top set, hit a few doubles or singles or something. And then next week you have some jump like 10 pounds more that you do and then you slowly ramp to competition or are you really just like figuring out where you're at and then jumping from there uh, if that um, makes sense more more of the first thing so the accessories do kind of wither away as i get closer to me i mean not completely usually i'll still have a couple of things but you know like the week of a competition for instance there might be like one or two accessories and le less sets you know than usual and probably with a lighter weight but yeah the, the accessories definitely fall off over time and I am, you know, ramping up, of course, the intensity over time. And I usually do it in about mm, four week incre increments. I uh, used to do it in like six, but that became a little bit too much. So four has been a lot more, um, has been a lot better for me since I've gotten like a bit stronger. And I'll kind of just do that into a meet in, in four week cycles. And then usually with, with the meet, I mean, it kind of depends. We've tried different approaches. Um, you know, for some meets, you know, we've tried to where like the week four of a block would be the, the meet week. I actually have found that I don't like that approach for competition specifically, just because I'm hitting the heaviest loads four weeks out. I like to be a little more acclimated to that kind of weight. So I found that usually like two week, two weeks out is kind of like the ideal sweet spot to hit a lot of that heaviest stuff, three at most, but but two preferably. And then have a week where it's easier. And then the fourth week is like uh, the, the meat. Does that change a bit based on the, like the different lifts? Like I know for me, I always like taking my heaviest deadlift like a little bit earlier than like the, the last squat and bench. I've like tried that. You know, it's for me personally, my experience, it's been about the same. I mean, it might be a little bit different with like for deadlift specifically with like sumo and conventional with sumo, you know, I can two weeks out is fine, but too far out for sumo is not good for me, but conventional, I can do like two weeks or three weeks. Either one works pretty well. As long as that one week out mark, I'm just not doing like a whole lot. <laughs> and then it'll be fine on the, on the day. Usually it, it's rare that it isn't. Conventional is also one of those lifts where in training, you generally want to be a bit more, in my opinion, a bit more exact because that one, it just seems like that one is it's just one of the harder ones to recover like properly for me and i see a lot of people kind of fizzle out sometimes you know when i or if i hit a lot of my heaviest stuff two or three weeks out that's kind of really what i'm doing it's just not out of formal meat yeah that makes sense actually that does yeah but i think that meets you know there i think there also is something different to meets too like for instance if i do a training session and i'm hitting the same weights that i would in the meet I might feel more beat up or taxed after the meet because, you know, there's different, there's sort of a different, I think, psychological load there that probably affects um, your, your fatigue as well. Mm. Is what you're experiencing 
mentally has like a massive impact on the the physical uh effects on the body because we talk about that with rehab stuff a lot too we talk about that with Peyton where like a lot of times when you're experiencing pain or you feel beat up or you feel sluggish or you feel weak sometimes it's just like you're just spending too much time at work or like you're just slightly you know you're having a little bit of caffeine before sleep and you might underestimate how much those things can have an effect on you in terms of your pain experience or injury risk so I think when you're in front of a crowd, the nerve like people have different profiles of how they experience that too. Cause some people really get really amped up, have a great time. Some people have the best lifts of their life in a college uh setting in the gym, right? Mm-hmm. Like because of the energy, the team environment. I think honestly, just the environment you're that you train in can be either anabolic or catabolic to an extent. No, hundred percent. It can. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I people say this. I'm not I'm not like you know the uh, first person I ever say this, but I do think a lot of the West side, the West side success that they had in powerlifting really was just like the aura of the intensity of the gym and the vibe of just being like, I'm here. It brings something else out of you. But I think there's something to be said for that, where having good training partners, if you have any, or just showing up in the right environment can honestly be a training factor that changes the entire way of preparation for any sort of event works. So, sometimes people train in their ho- homes in a home gym. While I I do love a lot of the convenience of a home gym, sometimes you just are never able to bring the same thing out of yourself. Yeah, absolutely. I'll give you a perfect example of this. So the last four years, you know, I just moved back to Texas like a week and a half ago. So the last four years I was living in the DMV area and, um, you know, nothing against it. There were a lot of nice gyms there, but um, I didn't have a lot of like sort of really many reliable training partners in my time there. And that definitely affected, I think, the quality of the lifting and the the energy that I had at a lot of the sessions. I mean, I still progressed and I still did very well, but I know it could have been a lot better. Anytime I would visit Texas or come back home, train at my stomping grounds, all of a sudden I'm doing stuff that, you know, that's, that's, that's ludicrous (laughs) Uh, for lack of better words. Like for instance, you know, the I travel 30 hours across the nation. I work literally along the way to get back to Texas um, in a straight swoop and I don't sleep. I come back. The first, the first place I go to is the gym. I'm immediately like lifting over 700 pounds for reps. That Monday I hit a triple, a 44 pound triple squat PR at 793. And then, you know, I just had a great training week all throughout this week after that. And it's just the people that I was around. I think that's one of the biggest, one of like the main differences is, is just me not being there and me being here. And I mean, the day that I was training heavy this last week, like this last deadlift day, for instance, um, we had like seven or eight guys in the gym that were totaling 2000 plus pounds. And that group of men, like the minimum squat in that group is like 700 pounds. Everyone there is strong. Everyone there is, you know, um, lifting heavy. And as a matter of fact, my friend um, Jesus is in that group, Jesus Olivares. And he has the number one raw total of all time right now, tested or untested. And he's a tested lifter. He's a natural lifter. So it's, you know, it's just kind of interesting to watch um, how training in this environment and this group has already had such a major effect on, um, you know, just my energy level coming into the gym, how excited I was to train and stuff like that. It's like worlds of difference. To what extent? Yeah, there's a lot of, there, there's research coming out with that is that you'll, you'll be experiencing the same amount of a cortisol dump and the same amount of stress chemically. Mm-hmm. But because of because of compounding other factors in the bloodstream, because of the psychology of where you're at, your tolerance for that is much higher. That's why I think a lot of people do hit their best numbers ever, usually at a competition that they almost feel like they could never really replicate. Uh, yeah. yeah, you could never replicate them at the gym. So it's like and the same thing with with sport performances. It, you know, we'll do a lot of things like that in terms of MMA and, and jujitsu right. boxing. I think one of the most important things also for guys learning and skill development is also the energy you bring in the gym. And and it's usually the coaches, but also the training partners that have a huge, big, you know, huge role to play in that. Some of the mo- the greatest assets in a lot of gyms at practice is actually some of the other athletes. And like some of the other athletes will bring an energy, a vibe to practice that mm-hmm. ha- makes other guys great at times that you could isn't even it's if i'm running a kickboxing class or anything like that it's it's not even credit to me in that case i do my best to add to it as well but sometimes i'm just thankful because i'm like hey this fella that just comes in every you know every night it honestly makes the gym 10 times better and brings out so much more out of everybody and that really flows and uh lifting is a unique thing because it's it can be done solo but the certain the certain vibe the certain vibe is really it's a it's its own training factor i'm very much a a yerkes dotson guy in my head and you know 
you know, on that curve, you know, there's like a certain level of, you know, arousal and, and anxiety that you need to perform at your absolute peak. And, you know, I think certain environments um, will, of course, um, give you a better chance of sort of reaching that level um, versus like perhaps like lifting alone in your basement. Um, yeah. Unless you're Pete Rouge. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I was making a joke back to the basement days. I'm, I'm sure you've both seen the basement days. Yeah, he used to train in the, um, yeah, I remember that. Let's lift next to his washing and his washer and dryer. Yeah, he would <laughs> grab the big bottle of ammonia, sniff out of it. <laughs> yeah. I remember like I, I blew up in popularity when I was lifting out of my, um, during the COVID thing, when I was, you know, lifting out of my apartment, like out of my squatting my apartment. And then I was deadlifting in the parking garage and stuff like that. And I cart all the weights out to the garage and back into my apartment good times so it's own workout yeah well the one thing i do love about a home gym is i it, sometimes i am beat man and i can just leave the place a mess if i want to yeah yeah like if you if it's one of those days like especially for me like if it's like a a tertiary bench day or something and you know like the all that energy and you know it, it's not really required like I might just go train by myself like on those days and it's a little bit more chill. You know, I get a nice pump with the accessories and, you know, the cardio, you know, I feel a lot better afterwards. And, you know, it's, it's kind of almost like a reset for the harder days. So, yeah.